want you to hit me as hard as you can. The 1980s, the golden age of testosterone on celluloid. The 80s gave us some of the most muscle-bound, manliest movies ever dreamed up. Movies that would arm wrestle you if you looked at them wrong, then celebrate with a stogie and walk off into the sunset with your girl. And in the midst of these testosterone-fueled days, there was one gem that outperformed all expectations, called simply Predator. Starring Austrian bodybuilder turned actor turned manliest action star of them all, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Predator took the box office by storm upon its release, and is today remembered as one of the standard bearers for action films coming out of that decade. The only aspect more confusing than trying to figure out where the hell that weird movement in the trees came from is trying to figure out how this movie ever finished filming. After all, director John McTiernan said in interviews long after filming that the first day of production was the worst nightmare he's ever experienced in his career, and it only got worse from there. Between bad special effects, sicknesses, the conditions of filming in the jungle, and a constant complainer from Brussels, it's a wonder that no one ran away from this film when they had the chance. Get to the chopper! Settle in, grab a cigar, and stick around as we figure out what the fuck happened to this movie. The story of how Predator came to be starts off with arguably the biggest action star of the 80s, maybe the biggest action star of all time. You guessed it, Sylvester Stallone. Stallone was mostly known at the time for the Rambo and Rocky franchises, and the latter was just about out of ideas. Well, at that time at least. By 1985, Rocky had beaten all the top opponents put in front of him, ending with the seemingly unbeatable Russian Ivan Drago. The film stacked the deck firmly against everyone's fighter, and he still came out on top by the end. There was a joke that started making its way around Tinseltown, that if there was ever a fifth Rocky film, the opponent would have to come from outer space, since Rocky had soundly defeated all the best human opponents. First-time screenwriters Jim and John Thomas thought it was better than a joke, and decided to build off that premise. Their original idea was to have a brotherhood of alien hunters who travel to Earth to hunt the most dangerous species on the planet. That idea eventually evolved into what audiences ended up seeing, Earth's most dangerous combat soldiers becoming prey and being hunted by the universe's deadliest predator. Writers Jim and John Thomas had no agent, no experience, and no idea whatsoever how to get someone to even look at a script, let alone sell one. And yet getting their screenplay, then titled Hunter, into the hands of a studio executive was actually surprisingly easy. The Thomas brothers slipped it under the door of Fox executive Michael Levy, who passed it on to other executives and the president of Fox. And just like that, the script was purchased. The film was offered to director John McTiernan, who later came to be known for such films as Die Hard, Last Action Hero, and The Hunt for Red October. At the time, McTiernan had only directed the Pierce Brosnan horror movie Nomads, but had been looking for a summer popcorn movie to help, a project exactly like Predator. Fox sent the script along to Arnold Schwarzenegger, who signed on as Dutch. Next up was the role of Dylan, which went to Apollo Creed himself, Carl Weathers. Weathers was cast because he had considerable experience compared to the other actors. McTiernan wanted someone that was both a great actor and in peak physical condition. Fox didn't really have the utmost of trust in the script provided by the Thomas brothers. After all, they were first-time writers with no experience on the scale of a huge summer blockbuster like Predator. Shane Black, on the other hand, had one writing credit to his name that was released to huge success just months before, Lethal Weapon. He had landed an acting role in Predator through producer Joel Silver, and Fox believed they could have the best of both worlds by having another writer involved. But when Black was asked to look at the script, he said he actually really enjoyed it and didn't want to touch it. When he claimed he was hired to act, not write, they decided to kill his character off first. The rest of the crew was a little different. The casting director originally wanted Vietnam vets for the various roles in Dutch's group, but it didn't work in his favor. He did luck out by having two veterans in the cast in Jesse Ventura and Richard Chavez, while some of the bigger, stronger men in Hollywood at the time rounded out the group. Bill Duke would play Mac, the quiet counterpart to Ventura's Blaine. Sonny Landon was hired to play the stoic Billy, a character that seems a bit more heroic than the actor himself. Landon was said to be very combative with those on the crew and there were enough incidents on set that the company that insured the film insisted that Landon be given his own bodyguard, not to protect him from others, but to protect others from him. In preparation for their roles, the cast went through intense military training. The actors were driven 20 miles into the jungle outside of Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and had to hike back to civilization on their own. The positive to come out of the experience was the camaraderie that the group had afterward, one that definitely showed on camera. But even with that bond, the cast claimed the experience was hell. The 20-mile hike through the jungle put its toll on everyone through various injuries and mishaps. Everyone but Jesse Ventura, 
Ventura was not only had experience in the armed forces as a member of the U.S. Navy's underwater demolition team. The training for that career made the hike a cakewalk for him. You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to bleed. Oh. Okay. The only other casting decision was for the title character himself, which finally went to the movie's most difficult cast member, none other than Jean-Claude Van Damme. More on that later, let's get into the film. The movie starts off in space, showing the Predator's arrival to Earth, in a scene that John McTiernan didn't even remember doing. Apparently, it was done entirely in post-production, because when McTiernan recorded the special edition DVD commentary for the film, he was genuinely surprised to see the opening sequence, saying, wow, I haven't seen this movie in a long time. We're then introduced to Dutch, who meets with Dylan, and the two give a handshake flex that rivals the watch glance from Top Gun for showing off. The reason the two look so ripped well, every actor on the film for that matter, was because Schwarzenegger had a gym shipped to the hotel where the cast stayed. It was set up in a ballroom, and the cast lifted weights every morning at 4 a.m. to have those toned, veiny muscles when they'd shoot. Things were said to get a little intense in that gym, like a fine cocktail mixing testosterone and performance enhancers, fueling a pre-dawn pissing contest. Carl Weathers always pumped like the rest of the cast, but often did it alone so no one could see him lift. What's the matter? The CIA got you pushing too many pencils? As for the rest of the gang, the pissing contest between actors continued throughout the rest of production. Anyway, the team is dropped into the jungle, where they soon make a horrible discovery. After finding three corpses that had been completely skinned, Dutch identifies them as Green Berets that he personally knew. The team reaches a guerrilla camp and strategically kills off all its insurgents, believing them to be responsible for the heinous act. After leaving the camp with a captive named Anna, the team sets off to the extraction point while they're unknowingly being hunted by the Predator. There were a whole slew of problems when it came to the Hunter, which was the original name for the creature. We mentioned earlier that Jean-Claude Van Damme had been cast as the extraterrestrial. Van Damme definitely had some credits under his belt at that point, but wasn't a star by any means. It wouldn't be until a year after Predator that he'd become a household name with Bloodsport unless you count this moment from 1984. He was hired because the alien hunting Dutch's crew was originally described in the script as a ninja-like creature. It was clear during the test footage, however, that both Van Damme and the Predator would be difficult to work with. The production wanted to take a page from Jaws, with a less is more sort of approach to the suit. They'd show it, but as little as possible. Part of this was the suspense, but it was mostly because of the budget. They couldn't afford something too fantastic. So to create the suit, Fox ended up hiring a company called Boss Film, who had worked on Ghostbusters and Big Trouble in Little China. And what they came up with was truly horrifying. Just not in the way the studio wanted. Filming was already underway when the suit arrived, so its arrival stopped production. When everyone saw it, everyone predictably hated it. Schwarzenegger called it a lizard suit with the head of a duck. It was reported to have weighed around 200 pounds, which was too restrictive for Van Damme. He was planning to show off his agility and his kickboxing skills. Van Damme detailed one of his most frustrating moments in an interview years later, stating, The costume took around 20 minutes to put on. It was thick rubber and I couldn't see anything. There was just a small piece to breathe through. I needed cables to move my jaw and head, and it was hard to keep my balance. They wanted me to make a big jump, and I told them, It's impossible from that height. I know my limitations and I'll break my legs. As it turned out, he was right. A stuntman was brought in to make the jump that Van Damme refused to do, and the stuntman broke his leg, both from the height of the jump and the weight of the suit. To capture those moments when the Predator moved swiftly through the trees, McTiernan wanted to see movements that were specifically unhuman. The plan at the time rested on the shoulders of a monkey. Yes, there was a monkey that was supposed to be the invisible Predator. The idea was he would swing from trees quickly, and production would use that to do those camouflage shots throughout the film. But when the red suit was brought out and placed on the monkey, he was apparently embarrassed by what he was wearing and he ended up hiding instead of swinging. They needed another tactic. As it turned out, this would be another job Van Damme would have to take on. The first outfit was bad enough, but this suit was an abomination. It looked like Elmo had walked into the jungle. When Van Damme saw the costume, word has it that he absolutely flipped. Special effects advisors had to assure him that they would remove the suit entirely in post-production. While this made wearing the suit easier for him to stomach, it just once again meant that Jean-Claude Van Damme was taking further steps away from being seen on camera. All of the tension on set made it clear that it was time for a break, and it was during this downtime that director John McTiernan sent some of the test footage back to the studio, showing the progress and, of course, the suit. He asked if the studio wanted them to continue with the current outfit, to which they got an emphatic no. Along with the suit being tossed, production also lost Jean-Claude Van Damme. It's right around here that reports get mixed up. 
What we know for sure is that Van Damme was fired. He didn't quit or leave in a mutual agreement, he got the axe. The why has been speculated for over 30 years. Some say it was because he complained, a lot. Schwarzenegger called him a relentless complainer. He complained about the weight of the suit, the conditions of the jungle, the lack of his face being shown, and the lack of kickboxing he could do. That was a major point of contention. Producer Joel Silver was overheard on set yelling at the muscles from Brussels, saying, you gotta stop kickboxing. Look, the Predator is not a kickboxer. Some say it was Van Damme's height. He stood at 5'10", which isn't exactly short, but that would make the Predator shorter than almost everyone he was hunting, which seemed less menacing. There were rumors that he passed out often from the heat in the jungle, while some say he was let go because he broke the head prop for the suit on purpose. Whether it was frustration or to force production to show his face, no one knows. It could have been any or all of those reasons. What mattered in the end was Van Damme was let go and was replaced by this guy. Kevin Peter Hall, who was over a foot taller than Van Damme, came in to play the Predator during the break from shooting. Hall physically towered over the cast and was a great actor to boot. Now all he needed to patch up this nightmare was a new suit for the monster. Stan Winston was hired to figure out a design. Schwarzenegger recommended him after his work on James Cameron's Terminator. The story goes that Winston was sketching out his ideas while on a flight with, you guessed it, James Cameron. He showed some of his sketches to Cameron, who mentioned that he had always wanted to see a monster with mandibles. Winston liked the idea and ended up adding that detail to his design. And ta-da! <laughs> Everyone knew they had something special on their hands. This was no longer a hunter like the old weird pink duck suit. This was something much more dangerous. The name of the film was officially changed to Predator. The Predator is one of the most menacing looking creatures ever put to film. It has an over seven foot frame, slimy reptilian looking skin, and alien dreadlocks. But it cannot be argued that the most unsettling creature of all is easily those mandibles. And you can thank James Cameron for that. Soon after the arrival of the new suit, production was back underway and spirits were hot. Then, by two weeks later, things started to look very different. Literally. Everything in the jungle appeared very different as leaves began falling rapidly from trees. According to McTiernan, the production designer for the film had not actually done any research into the jungle on the west coast of Central America, and was unaware that the trees lose their leaves. To make up for the huge visual gaffe, production had to add mass amounts of fake leaves to every shot, so the jungle would appear like, you know, a jungle. Even though the dead leaves covered the ground, the trees definitely appeared more dense on screen. Still, one eagle-eyed critic for the New York Times later noted that the trees looked like New Hampshire woods in November. As production continued, conditions on set worsened. Almost every member of the cast and crew got sick at some point. The drinking water at the hotel where crew stayed was not properly filtered, and many members would regularly work with a fever or diarrhea. John McTiernan flat out refused to eat the local food in the area, out of fear that it would make him sick. By the end of production, he had lost 25 pounds. He claimed the line producer had lost 40. Schwarzenegger tried his best not to drink the water unless he had to, and he ate less on set as well and it's been noted that his weight varies throughout the film. He struggled with dehydration from the conditions and had to perform one scene with an IV in his arm. In one way or another, the jungle was taking its toll on everyone. Richard Chavez, who played Poncho in the film, seemed to get the worst of the insects on location. At one point in production, he laid on the ground between takes and was soon covered in red ants. He was bitten almost a hundred times on his arms. At another point, he was asked to dinner with Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver, who were actually married during the making of the film. According to Chavez, when the invitation call came in, he was actually in the shower pulling ticks off his balls. That'll make your skin crawl. The worst condition of all had to be the heat. The temperature in the jungle on a regular day was in the upper 90s, the same as human body temperature, which begs the question, how would they show up on the heat vision cameras if the scenery was the same temperature as humans? Wouldn't people be perfectly camouflaged? Right you are, actually, which presented yet another production challenge. On top of that, the cord used for the infrared camera would only stretch about four feet away from the production van, so that was a nightmare as well. It would take some human ingenuity to solve this issue. First, the cast was told to stand close to a fire for a long period of time to raise their body temperature above the already sweltering conditions of the jungle. Haven't you done enough to these people? <laughs> Not only did the cast absolutely hate that idea, it didn't actually work. On to plan two. The crew would try to cool the scenery by spraying it down with ice water while the overheated actors looked on. That idea didn't work either. Just like the suit, McTiernan would have to go to Fox to beg for more money so the process could be changed. Rather than filmed with infrared cameras, those effects were ultimately all done in post-production. In the end, despite the hundreds of hiccups, Predator pulls off something fantastic. Blatantly borrowing from two popular franchises at the time, Alien and Rambo, 
Predator manages to create something completely unique, and consequently created a franchise of its own. Predator opened on June 12, 1987, and grossed $12 million on its opening weekend, a huge box office haul for the 1980s. It was the second highest weekend opening that year, only losing out to Beverly Hills Cop 2. The movie went on to gross just over $98 million at the worldwide box office, on a budget around $18 million. While audiences were coming out in droves to express their excitement for the film, critics didn't exactly feel the same way. The New York Times described the film as grisly and dull with few surprises, while the Los Angeles Times took it a step further, calling it arguably one of the emptiest, feeblest, most derivative scripts ever made as a major studio movie. Pretty harsh. However, retrospective reviews have been kinder to the film. Film 4 called it a fast-paced, high-testosterone, edge-of-the-seat experience while a review from Empire in 2000 proclaimed that Predator has gradually become a sci-fi and action classic. John McTiernan's direction is claustrophobic, fluid, and assured, staging the action with aplomb, but concentrating just as much on tension and atmosphere, a thumping piece of powerhouse cinema. The legacy of Predator was solidified over time, as Predator 2 was made just three years later, and to make things a little easier on the cast this time around, the jungle the Predator would land in was a concrete one in downtown Los Angeles. After countless comic books, video game appearances, action figures, and novels, the tease at the end of Predator 2 came to life in a pair of less-than-stellar Alien vs. Predator films, one of which had a human and a predator becoming an unlikely duo. It's a bomb. The film also spawned a loose reboot in 2010's Predators, produced by Robert Rodriguez. Shane Black returned to the franchise to helm 2018's The Predator, which, to be honest, kind of deserves its own what the fuck happened. Schwarzenegger was contacted for many of the other Predator films in the hopes that he'd do a cameo or come back in a starring role. Aside from lending his voice and likeness to the video game Predator Hunting Grounds, he has turned down every single chance to return to the franchise. After the agonizing experience of making the first movie, you would think you'd know why. But in fact, every time he received an offer, he simply didn't like one of two things, the script or the money. The script is easy to understand. No story ever matched the testosterone-fueled badass original. But the money? We know the winner of that pissing contest.